Okay. Um, so before we begin, I wanted to just go over really quickly what we're going to be talking about today. And I read in uh, the email Dylan sent out that um, we're going to go over some species and I wanted to reframe that and we're not going to talk too much about species. There's going to be a lot of really great pictures and I'm happy to tell you what they are. Um, but due <coughs> to the funny nature of slime molds, they're really hard to identify down to the species. So I think there's a lot of really cool things to learn looking at the species as a whole um, and not necessarily like narrowing it down. Um, so without further ado, I'm so excited to talk to you about slime molds and please feel free to unmute and interrupt me if you have any questions. If you write it in the chat, I might not be able to see it. So Dylan, feel free to interrupt me if someone to, um, asks a question in the chat. So slime molds. First, I wanna talk about that there are actually three different types of slime mold. So slime mold is this colloquial term that we have given to three very different types of organisms. And they all have one thing in common, which is that they are amoebas that produce cells. And that's kind of what put them in the club. But beyond that, they are pretty different. So I'm gonna briefly go over what the three kinds are, but the one we're gonna be talking about today is this last one, mycogastria. And that is our, our beloved, beautiful slime mold that we see at places like Henry Cowell. So the first one are called dictostelids, and these are cellular slime molds or the social amoeba, which are some really cool nicknames for them. And uh, these are very interesting, and they are a really great example of altruism in nature. Um, and I'll get that get into that in a minute. But what makes these what they are are um, they feed mostly on bacteria. You see them in, well, you don't see them. <laughs> they live in the soil or leaf litter, but they cannot be seen by the naked eye. And there's only 89 species known to science. So if you wanna become an expert in something, that's a good place to start. You know, 89, you can, you can get them down, look under the microscope. Um, so what is back to the altruism? Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought. Um, but they um, look, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be doing this. <laughs> I haven't interpreted in so long. I wanna share that too. I miss you guys and uh, working with you all. Um, so they look like this picture. There is a stalk and a spore and then in, in the, the spore head. <laughs> And um, when food is available, they act as single cells. So they're solitary, they're doing their own thing. They feed, they divide, they repeat. But when food is no longer present, they aggregate into this multicellular structure, um, which has some, some fun nicknames, one of which is Grex, which I like as a nickname. And this is where that altruism comes in because when they aggregate, not all of those cells are gonna get the opportunity to uh, reproduce. They have to all work together for certain ones to be able to release spores. So there are some that are never biologically going to reproduce. So that's an interesting uh, kind of lifestyle that we don't see too often that they have to work together for the greater good of the species. And moving on to our next one, those are called protostelids, and these are the least well known, the most often overlooked, and there are 45 species known to science. So you can really become an expert in those. And they are very, very simple. They are a stalk with a spore, a sporothica on head, and that is what produces spores. And this will produce anywhere between one and eight spores. So they're very simple. They are also found um, in dead plant matter and they eat bacteria and yeast and fungal cells and you need a microscope to look at them. And if you are interested in this, uh, this man right here, Fred Spiegel, created a wonderful guide to the 36 most common species and it's free online. Um, if anyone is actually interested, I could, I could send that later along with the slides. Um, and there he describes them and whether or not you're ever going to look into a microscope and look at these, it's still pretty interesting to see all the, the work that goes into looking at these 
tiny organisms that we never actually get to see with our bare eyes. And on to the final one is mycogastria, which is also known as plasmodial slime mold. This can be seen with the naked eye. There are 888 species known to science. And I made this slideshow in 2019 and I looked it up last night. It says there's over 900 now. Um, so we'll have to uh, figure that out. I don't know, some new ones. And these are some really cool pictures and they are all of the same species. This is called Leocarpus fragilis. And it's one you might see at Henry Cowell. It's a pretty common one. One of its common names is the um, insect egg slime, which I think is pretty fitting. And it, we'll get into the life cycle later, but we're looking at two pictures, one here and one here of its mature fruiting bodies and a picture here of it in its plasmodial stage. And then a picture here of its spores. So all one thing looking very different. So now this is my pop quiz after all of that. Um, and feel free to unmute. There's, I have zero expectation. I couldn't tell you a single one of these, um, what they are, but it's kind of fun um, to think about it. So does anyone have any guesses of like what we're looking at in this photo? Some are the things I just talked about, some are not. It's totally fine to not know. We don't have any guesses, I can move along. But just look at that one. That is that is crazy. You guys can see my mouse, right? When I do that. <laughs> cool. Um, so, right. oh. Oops, went too far. So in pictures A and B, we are looking at protostellids. So those are those super simple ones, a stalk and a sporothica head that produces one to eight spores. C and D, we are looking at a type of fungi, which is interesting. They look pretty different. Um, e is a type of one of those cellular slime molds, which the dictostelids. Um, F is a mycobacterium, which is interesting. And um, I can't see my own notes right here. This last one is a free living amoeba that can cause brain infections. So stay away from that one. Um, but these are all super tiny and interesting. So getting into the beloved slime mold. What is a slime mold? We hear mold and you would assume it's a mold, a type of fungus, but it's not a fungus at all. It is a protozoa, but it has been studied under the same umbrella as, as mushrooms and fungus has, mostly because it has had a complicated history um, in science deciding what it is to get to its point now, but also you can find it in very similar um, environments that you would find mushrooms. So going back to that complicated life history, in its time known to science, it has been classified as a plant, but unlike plants, it doesn't um, produce any chlorophyll. It was classified as a fungus for a while, but it consumes food in a very different way than fungus does, and we'll get into how it consumes food later. And it was even an animal because it moves um, so someone along the way said, that sounds like an animal to me, but it was very far from an animal. So once again, what puts it in the slime mold club is that it is amoeba that produces spores. So these pictures here are all different fruiting bodies. And this is the um, sexual mature uh, life cycles of the slime mold. Um, so again, we can talk about some things you might see at Henry Cowell. I didn't label this, but if anyone wants the slides, I can. These ones on the top left, their common name is wolf's milk slime mold. And you can often see it when it's a little bit younger in this bright, vivid, Pepto-Bismol pink color. And it pops like a zit, which is um, fun for some, maybe not for others. And then as it matures, um, the, the goopy insides becomes hard and a powdery spore. And then this one here is called dog vomit slime mold. It is a super common slime mold and one of the few that we get to see in the summertime. I remember seeing a really big one in the campground growing on this, on this stump and I got to watch it for a while. It was a bit paler in color, a little bit 
just a soft yellow um, than this one is here. And this is a fun slime mold because in the 70s in Texas, I think in Dallas or a suburb of Dallas, somebody found this on their lawn. It often grows in um, gardens and they called the police and said, there is an alien in my yard and it made the news. Um, they said, aliens come to Dallas, but really it was just the slime mold. Um, so it has been baffling us for a while. And then this one, um, on the bottom right here is called, it doesn't have a fun common name. You can give it one if you want, but uh, Sierra, Sierra Mica Fruticulosa, I think. I could be wrong, but this is a really common one I've seen um, right after it rains. So when we get our first big rain, this one starts to come up all over logs and it's a really nice kind of like wet January or whatever time we get rain slime mold. And then this one, you could see ones that look like this. I don't know what species it is, but for some context, this is my, my finger in that photo. Uh, they are very small and very cute. <laughs> so breaking down the fruiting body even more, um, we're looking at its elements here. So this whole top head part is called the sporothica and it's the head that holds the spores. Um, within it, these fuzzy bits are called the capitulium, um, and they are these thread-like fuzzy structures, and the spores are found within them, kind of nestled in there, and it helps protect the spores until they're mature and ready to blow away in the wind or whatever life they may live. Um, the peridium you can see on this hardened brown part, and that protects the whole thing as it matures. Um, and eventually, depending on the species, uh, the peridium will break open. Uh, you can kind of see it cracking on this one and this one. And that is when we see those fuzzy capitulium threads. Um, the calliculus <laughs> is what is left of the peridium once it breaks through. And that is that little cup-like structure. And then we have the stalk, which is the stalk, perfect. And uh, the hypothallus is a layer, so it's within the substrate here, it's this dark color. And that is um, kind of leftover hardened plasmodium, um, which we will talk about also. It is a different life cycle stage of the slime mold. And uh, this is sort of leftover on the substrate that it comes out of, comes up from. Uh, so, since we have so many different slime molds that look so different, it's really hard to put these labels on as like a general term. So I'm gonna show you a different type of slime mold and some other terms. Uh, so the same terms, but the sporothica, the head part looks very different on this one. It's the long stringies. Um, the stalk is a lot more fragile and delicate than that last kind. And you can see it extends into the sporothica um, and that is what we call the columella, columella, columella. The trouble with writing a book about this is I've written so many of these words and don't say them out loud too often. <laughs> so it's easy to get a little tripped up, but. I have a question. Yes. If we were to see something like this on a walk and trying to explain what it is to Visitors, uh, is this part of the communication system in the forest between different plants and different trees and sharing of uh, different uh, nutrients for those who are deficient and the, those who are deficient sharing nutrients back to some other kind of plant or animal? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting question. That's a good one. Um, and I know, like when you're talking about mushrooms, the mycelium is such a cool way to talk about how it's all interconnected. But as far as I know, there are some interesting ecological relationships that slime mold does have. And I have some slides about that near the end of this, but it does not participate in those um, communication structures that exist. It is kind of doing its own thing. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in this next part, we're gonna talk about a different um, 
time in its life cycle, and that is called the plasmodium. Um, so we're going to get into the life cycle, but this is its time when it eats and moves, um, which is it's crazy that a thing without a brain can move, but it does. So it, during this time, is doing all of its eating and all of its moving that it will ever do. Um, so it is eating mostly bacteria, um, but it'll also eat yeast, fungal spores, hyphae, which do make up that um, communication network with mushrooms and algal cells. Um, and for this reason, you often find it um, on logs but you can find it in leaf litter too, but from my experience, you're gonna find it most often on logs. And this is where it's, it's happy and it's eating. Um, so it engulfs its food through a process called phagocytosis. And this is a super common eating method for single celled organisms. Um, so my next slide kind of goes into how that works, that phagocytosis. So um, breaking it down in the simplest ways, it, it opens some holes in itself engulfs the food and then closes those holes and releases an enzyme uh, that breaks down that food. So this is the reason, one of the many reasons I'm sure, but one of the major reasons that we don't call it a fungus because funguses eat their food in a very different way. And depending on the fungus that looks differently, uh, but this is super common um, along single celled organisms. Um, including plant mold. So back to moving. They can move up to 22 millimeters an hour, which is pretty impressive for something without a brain. Um, you know, had, has nothing on the banana slug, but that's pretty good. Um, and it is, it is moving while it's looking for food to eat, to engulf itself on. So the process of moving is called cytoplasmic streaming. And it works in a way that you could compare it to um, our muscles. So um, imagine the system of fibers that contract and they are powered by ATP and um, they kind of do while they are contracting um, this two step forwards, one step back motion. Uh, so I have some videos in the next slide uh, that kind of show this, this movement. Um, and the streaming can be visible under a microscope. Um, or if you're really patient, you could, you could get, if you get up close with a hand lens, you can kind of see it pulsing if you were to find it in this state, which is really cool. Um, so let's see if my videos work. Cross our fingers. Oops, no, okay. So I'm gonna skip forward on this one because it's long and the beginning was um, less important. But this is showing that, that streaming. It is urging forward. It is over here in the bottom and over here, those are oats. So this slime mold is making its way towards oats. When you're using it in a lab setting, oats are a really common uh, food source that people like to use. And um, I can mute this, this music's a little scary. <laughs> but if you ever wanted to, to culture slime molds yourself, which I have, I've never successfully done, I have tried and failed, um, but oats are a really great uh, food source for it. And then my next video, I'll pause that, is up close, so this is under a microscope. And this, you can really see that pulsing motion. I, uh, if you look at all these ones suggested on YouTube, there's lots of great videos of slime molds um, moving around on YouTube. Uh, so this next one, I have, um, this is an interesting experiment that scientists have done with slime mold. Uh, so on this map, this is, um, right here in the middle, this is Tokyo. And um, they put dots of, of food, I don't know if it's oats or something else, um, where Tokyo's subway stations are. And they watched to see if the slime mold would find the quickest possible route between all these stations. 
Um, and it kind of mimicked the actual Tokyo subway station, which or a uh, subway system, which looks like this. And there's been a lot of different experiments in the same vein as this one. I know there's ones where it mimicked uh, Canada's highway system and things like that. So it's a pretty interesting thought that you could use it um, for like civil planning. I don't know if it's actually done, um, but it could, it could give you some new ideas, maybe routes you haven't thought of, because it's always looking for the fastest possible way to get from one food source to another. So next I have the life cycle. Um, and I'm going to not try to go too much in depth into this, um, but we get a really interesting overview. So the fruiting body is where we will start. And this is what we were looking at in those initial pictures. And the fruiting body will mature and it will release a spore. And the spore goes through a series of um, different kind of biological divisions until it <laughs> so it goes through first a form of asexual reproduction through these divisions. And then we are ending with, um, we call this an amoebo flagella. And um, the difference between these two, I use my finger to point, is if water is present, the amoebo flagella will form these little tails. But if water is not present, it won't have those tails. So then we have all these little amoeba flagellas, and they then need to find a compatible one to sexually reproduce. So that's what we're looking at down here. And they will fuse together and then form a zygote. And that zygote will go through more series of divisions, and it'll end up being a single cell with up to hundreds to billions of nuclei. So we are looking at one cell here which is pretty crazy. And the, um, this will continue to divide. And then from that, the plasmodia will form. And during this time, it has a pretty cool um, backup plan, you could say. So if conditions are not good, if it is way too dry or not enough food around, it will harden itself and become a giant cyst, basically. And this cyst can remain um, up to a couple years and just hang out, waiting for those correct conditions to come back. And then it will um, turn back into the plasmodia, which is just a really interesting um, life style. <laughs> I have somewhere in my house, I tried to culture slime mold and it, it sclerotiumed on me. And I have it somewhere in a tackle box. It's just this little, um, it's a, it's a redwood, uh, it's not a leaf, um, but, uh, and maybe in a couple of years uh, with the right, you know, luck and, and wishes, I can get it to, to jump back into <laughs> its life. It's probably about five or six years old at this point though. Um, so the plasmodia will then do uh, that moving and eating and it will reach a point, and this is a really interesting unknown to science about what conditions are needed to make it begin to rise into those fruiting bodies. And I love unknown to sciences because there's so much work we still have out there to figure out what will cause this. There's a lot of theories. It's probably moisture and weather and even pH or sunlight. Um, but we don't exactly know everything it takes for them, these fruiting bodies to rise. So from the plasmodia, the fruiting bodies will rise, they will mature, and then they will release the spore and the cycle continues. Could, could I ask a question about ploidy on all those stages? About what? About ploidy. So like the spore I assume was made through meiosis? It is, correct, yeah. And so in the plasmodial stage, are they all diploid nuclei? This is a really good question. Um, I, will, I will need to uh, look at my notes for this. Um, they, depending on the part of its cycle, it does have diploid and haploid cells. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to remember during, I can't get to my second, 
screen. Um, pardon me. I have emergency notes if I have technical difficulties. May I ask a question while you're looking? Um, sure, I'm, I'm gonna go back to that first one and say, I might have to get back to you if I'm being completely honest, like the, the cell um, biology of it is not my strong suit. Um, and I don't want to misspeak. <laughs> Thanks, I'll, I'll look into it too. I've been wanting to know for a long time. So. Yeah, there's some really great resources, much um, more certain of themselves than me. Uh, what was your question, Sophia? <laughs> so I was walking along the river trail and I saw on the underside of a, a trunk above my head, something that looked like this. It, it looked like a really flattened um, fungus or, but, and I, it didn't look like a lichen, but it seemed to have edges like that, very flat on the underside of the like dead, trunk does that sound like a slime mold has anyone else seen that what color was it it was kind of whitish and maybe some brownish you know in the center but like maybe whitish around the edges and did it look um two questions is so was it was it textured at all what were you thinking this looked more like the fruiting body or the plasmodia um, when it's really flattened. Okay. You know, um, and it was very, they were like large discs, maybe a foot in diameter, um, not small. That's interesting. I'm just wondering really, if anybody's seen that. Is it still there? I haven't, I haven't been that way lately. You know, okay. this is maybe a week or so ago. Okay, it's really hard to say. Um, it could have been. It sounds like a, a place it would hang out. If I can find a picture, I'll send it. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> so I, I yeah. the answer. The right hand side is haploid and the left hand side is, which I guess makes sense. And so meiosis happens to make those spores. My one other question is how long does that, the haploid amoebae, how, how long do, the, do those survive? Are they, because they're just sperm and egg cells. So are they, do they only last like a month or do they, could they last like years? Do you know? That's a really, yeah. I, I don't know on a normal scale, like, in a perfect vacuum condition, how quickly that would happen. But during that time, it also has its own, similar to the sclerotium, um, kind of protective moment also. And it's called uh, the microcyst. So it can turn itself into a microcyst and it behaves similarly to the sclerotium, but that can survive again for years, um, just waiting for um, the right time to come back. Cool, thank you. Yeah, that was like half an answer to your question. <laughs> Amazing. No, it's really interesting. Yeah, they're, if, if you are interested in cell biology, they are really, really crazy. Oops, what am I doing? Going too far. Okay, so next I wanted to talk about spores. I'm not going to talk about them too in depth, um, just kind of show what a slime mold looks like and what its spore looks like um, and how tiny they really are. So this, oh yeah, okay. So this first one, this is uh, Meta Metatrichia floriformis. And this is a slime mold that you can find really commonly in Henry Cowell. There are these beautiful deep blue um, top parts in this, uh, beautiful golden yellow capitulium threads. And um, one really interesting thing I noticed is one winter, this was like a weed in the forests around us. I don't know what happened, but it was everywhere. 
And I was on a slime mold Facebook group, of course. And there's a man in England and it was also like a weed at the exact same time, exactly where he was. So I can't draw any crazy conclusions from that, um, but it was really interesting to see the exact same species behaving the exact same way, continents apart. Um, so onto the spores. So this is 10 micrometers, micrometers. And for comparison, the eye of a needle is a, over 1200 micrometers. A human hair, like the end of it is about 70 and beach sand can be anywhere from 100 to 200. Uh, so these are really small. Um, they are never perfectly smooth, but they are pretty round. And um, a good way to tell them from fungal spores is fungal spores are never nearly round. They are always oblong or football shaped or something else, um, but never perfectly um, close enough to a circle. And they are found in every color except green and blue. And this again is their, their reproductive uh, unit. And this is uh, trachea varia. So trachea um, doesn't again have a cute common name, but it's a pretty common um, genus that you'll see around. And they are these kind of, they can have stalks and a head or just be flat on its substrate. Um, but they are often this kind of brownish color, white when they're younger, and then can get pretty vivid yellow um, also as they mature. And then this spore is Badhamia utricularis, and this one is called the hanging slime mold, which is another one you might encounter. Um, and I have a picture of it here. It's um, Plasmodium is specifically, um, it really likes to eat fungus more than other ones I've seen. So you'll often see this um, on different funguses. It's, it'll be eating at it. And I have a picture of that later for us. But as it matures, instead of going up with the stalk, it hangs down. And it's this really pretty pale blue color when it's young and it matures to like a deep gray. And this next one um, is Physarium viridi, viridi. <laughs> and it is this really pretty uh, green one, which is kind of greenish yellow. You don't really see um, that color in slime molds too often, that green. So that is really pretty. Um, next, we we're talking about its ecology a bit earlier. What is its role? What is it doing? Um, its main role is it is decomposing logs. So we don't have, it's crazy to think about what we would, the world would look like if we did not have decomposers. We would just have logs up to beyond our head if we did not have these. Um, they also have relationship with certain insects. There's a beetle called the slime mold beetle, which is a great name. And they lay their eggs um, directly in the slime mold. And there's also some flies that do the same thing. This fly will build a web in it um, and then as it lay its eggs, and then as the eggs mature, they will actually eat it. And both the beetle and um, these flies inadvertently help spread the slime mold spores. Um, and there are fungi that eat slime molds and slime molds that eat fungi. So in this picture here is a slime mold um, infected by a fungus. That's those white threads all over it. Um, and these are pretty common to see, especially with older slime mold. You will see them kind of covered in this white fuzziness. And then its last, well not last, I'm sure many, but its next role in ecology is its relationship with humans. Um, so there were our indigenous people in Mexico who will eat young plasmodia and they'll actually uh, fry it up like scrambled eggs, um, which is, I'm curious how that would taste. Um, I have also uh, eaten a slime mold out of just morbid curiosity, and I can compare it. It tasted like um, I was in a pine forest, kind of pine dominated, and it, it tasted very piney, but also like ghee, if you've ever had ghee, kind of uh, that, that texture. So that was um, when the curiosity got the best of me, and maybe that's how I'll die. I don't know. Um, this next one is the Badhemia utricularis, again, that's that hanging slime mold, uh, that one that loves to eat fungi. So we see it here on the mushroom. 
And these pictures were taken a day apart. I took these um, up at UC Santa Cruz earlier this year. Um, so yeah, that was one day different on my lunch break walk, um, which was really shocking to see. I was just kind of losing my mind and I dragged my coworkers out there and I was like, look at this, they're like, okay. Um, but pretty cool. And my last kind of point is talking about where you can find them. Um, so they, when you're talking about slime molds on a species level, they have no geographic boundaries, which is so crazy for a species. So you can find the exact same species of slime mold here as you can in England, as you can in Tasmania. As long as the conditions are the same, they will, they will occur. And this is probably due to their spores being able to travel through the air so well. Um, so that makes them another really interesting thing to study is you could, you could become familiar with slime molds and it's not dependent on where you are physically. Um, they are on every continent except Antarctica um, because there's not trees there for them, but you, there are certain species that do grow in the snow, snow banks. There are ones that you can find in the desert. Um, but for the most part, we are in one of the best places to actually see them. Um, they love wet forests. They're, the best time of year to see them is whenever it's rainy. And here that could be October, that could be March, um, depending on the year. But as long as it's, it's wet, you're pretty likely to see them. There are some you can see in summer, like that dog vomit slime mold, the one that uh, was thought to be an alien. Um, but yeah, we are in an absolutely fantastic place to see them. And this is a funny one that I took uh, at Natural Bridges of slime molds, not growing on the dead butterfly, but next to the dead butterfly. And you think about Natural Bridges is so different than Henry Cowell. It is right on the beach. Um, I found this, I think it was in some eucalyptus, but they're there. If you're looking, they are there in the leaf litter. And then I went back to this one, I think it was two hours later, and it looked like that, which was, pretty exciting <laughs> to me. There's these pretty little rainbows. There's a whole physics of how those, the rainbows work that I is so beyond me, but that was a pretty crazy two hour difference. And with that, um, I have a beautiful picture of the egg, uh, insect egg slime mold once again. And this was, um, all three of these are that same slime mold. Um, so you can just see how they look so different depending on where they are in their life cycle. Um, yeah, and if anyone else has any questions, I would love to answer them, but that is what I have prepared. Well, I have a question, Carrie. Hi, Don. Hi. I, I've been wondering while you've been talking about this, do you have a species of slime mold that's named after you? Do you? Are, <laughs> that's actually funny you asked that because this man reached out to me who is an author and he's writing a sci-fi novel it's not out yet um about slime molds and he uh it's this kind of like um god-like slime mold um uh, that comes and visits other planets and he did name that slime mold after me which is just one of the strangest things to happen to me in my life so have you been talking to him <laughs> How did, that's, that seems like a loaded question <laughs> Well, not exactly, but but I would say, I mean, as we go through life, it's kind of nice to have something that will be there, named after you, after you're no longer there. Yeah, and I will, I, I guess my um, my my legacy will be this guy's uh, sci-fi slime mold. Well, <laughs> hey, Carrie, I'm upward. What was that? Onward Sorry, Don, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you still? <laughs> Onward and upward, agreed. <laughs> okay, go. Um, okay, Carrie, I am curious if there are certain things that help with the spore dispersal depending on the orientation of uh, like how the fruit body grows. Because you said some grow up and some grow down. And so I'm curious if that, it, like evolutionarily, if that, developed an association with something that helps with the spore dispersal? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
I'm sure there are advantages and disadvantages of each species, depending on if it has a stalk or it's hanging. Um, but the one thing that does come to mind is when it is in its plasmodial stage and it is eating um, and moving, it will intentionally move from the bottom of a log where it is wettest and most delicious to the top where it will get better airflow. And it is more likely for those spores to be spread or an insect to come on them or something of deer to brush by. Uh, so it does have that evolutionary, um, I don't wanna say choice, cause it's not a choice, but it, it does do that um, in order to spread its spores more efficiently. Both the upward uh, facing fruit bodies and the downward facing fruit bodies? I can't say that with certainty. Um, um. But I know, I know some do. I, it's hard to say um, with any any sort of certainty on own, like a, in a definitive level. But maybe the smart ones got <laughs> yeah, one brain cell. I have one more. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, what slime molds are, are are noticed to have appeared? How long do they hang around in that location? You know, before they're, uh, they just are, I'm not sure whatever happens to them, but how long do they stay there? Like mushrooms that might be there for maybe a week to a month max, but men are gone. How, how about slime molds? How does, uh, how, what happens there? That's another really good question. Um, so they can tend to stick around pretty well. It will be until some force beyond itself um, gets rid of it. So a big rain will wash them away. Heavy winds will wash them away. Um, if log rolls over, you know, they're done. Um, but I have seen fruiting bodies persist for months on end, if nothing um, is messing with them. And they get really like, they look spent, they are done, they have done their thing. Um, but they don't um, really start to, they don't, they don't break down like a mushroom does. They, they will be persistent until they, uh, some outside force gets them. Well, a couple of years back, uh, when you were at Henry Cowell, we went on a walk with you, and <coughs> you point out some uh, slime molds on the uh, pipeline trail, and I wonder if they're still there. Maybe, maybe a spore tucked away some in some crevice of a tree. Yeah, that would be, I bet you would find the same or different species in those same spots. Um, probably not the same individuals, but I do tend to see the same places um, again and again, year after year, they will, they will come up in that same spot. <coughs> well, I happen to remember that spot. So I'll go pay it a visit and yeah. see for myself. Yeah, the river trail has a lot of really great little nooks and crannies to look for them. And it's a fun one to take People too, if you're if you're interested in looking, because you don't really have to go off trail, um, as we we don't want to, you know. But there's a lot of things on the trail um, where you can see slime molds. A lot of good logs, just kind of right there. I'll let you know what I find. <laughs> yeah, let me know. Yeah. Carrie, hi. This is Claire. Hi. 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 Good to hear your voice. Good to hear your voice too. Good to hear your voice too. So my question is, you talk about them moving toward the food when they're eating and engulfing it. How do they know where it is? <coughs> really good. I mean, really is there question. something, is there something it, that, I don't know, if it can't be a sense, sense of smell, but there must be something that draws them in the direction of the food. Yeah. yeah some reason why they move in that direction. So there's something drawing them to it, right? Is it the smell of it? Is it, it do you have any idea what, what it is that they're moving toward or why they're moving in that particular direction is because they seem to sense it? I don't. I don't. And that's and that's to, to, to inspire, inspire some, some energy. Because, <laughs> because that's a great question. That's a great question. So that's a bad answer. Um, but if I, I if I do figure that out, I'll let you know. 
Okay, great. I would love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Carrie, do you know how far the spores can, like, can travel and still be viable? Yeah, I think that's hard, again, to put a definitive answer on, but I've seen figures where they can travel really, really far. And the fact that we have uh, the same species continents apart, I think, is really good evidence of that, um, that they can uh, the shape of the spores themselves have really helped them evolutionarily like Tra tra traject themselves uh, through the air. Um, so again, I don't want to put any figures on it, but if the fact that we have have found the exactly the same species so far, oceans apart, they are they they can get pretty far. Hmm. And that sci-fi guy says they can can uh, go through space too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. If they eat fungus and bacteria, can they be used to combat illnesses? That's another really good question. Um, I don't know if I'm I'm the one to to answer that, but uh, I would love to see I would love to see someone figure that out, like like viruses and and that kind of thing. Just that that I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Carrie, where can we uh, buy a copy of your book? Where can we find this? Thanks for the plug. Um, it's available on Amazon, but if a lot of people or even just one person is interested, I would be happy to bring some copies up to Henry Cowell and give you guys a discount because um, I don't really like Amazon that much. Um, and yeah, so if, if anyone is interested, I can, I can uh, sell you a copy for much cheaper than it is on Amazon. I'm happy to do that. I could just drop off a stack at the visitor center even. I have maybe like 10 or 15 copies just under my bed gathering guests. So <laughs> would love to uh, get those in some hands. Carrie, how much would they be? I'll say 10. Okay. Yeah, they're about 17 on Amazon, so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, Don has his. <laughs> All right. Can Dylan let us know when he has them? Yeah, if that works for you, Dylan. That works. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if there's a, a more than 10 people, I don't know if that, that'll happen, but I can get more copies. It just might take a couple weeks. Okay. So, Carrie, how did you get interested in slime molds? That's, that's a really great question too. Um, I've loved tiny things since I was a little kid, just like the fascination with, with little. Um, and I love a good Easter egg hunt. So those were kind of like my personality, the things that got me kind of really excited on this. Um, and then when I went to, as a student at UC Santa Cruz and I was living in the Redwood Forest and surrounded by all these organisms that I knew nothing about and were, was so excited to learn about it. And um, my gateway was definitely mushrooms first. A big rain happened, a huge storm in, I don't remember what year it was, but every mushroom that was gonna pop up, popped up at once. And it was just an incredible experience. And then the more time I got to spend in those kind of environments, I began noticing the slime molds. Um, and I do remember at one point I was, I was reluctant to learn because I, I had a world of mushrooms. I still have a world of mushrooms to know. And I was like, ah, slime mold, I don't have time for that. Like I, I, there's so many other things to learn, um, but I don't know. I think just their strange nature got the better of me and I became fascinated. And then um, my senior year, my exit project from UC Santa Cruz was, was the book I created and um, it's not exactly a field guide because uh, field guides tend to be for a certain location. And as we talked about, the slime molds don't have certain locations they grow in, but I do outline, I think about 22 species you're somewhat likely to encounter anywhere. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Of that. course. Yeah. 
I will also say, Carrie, in, in your book, you you framed it as a love story, which <laughs> makes it like, it, it's a very excitable read. So like, not just a resource to like, you know, have to learn about slime molds, but like, it was super, super fun to read too, because of like, how you framed it. Thank you. That, that's a really, really kind compliment. One of my um, favorite um, kind of natural history books is David Aurora's uh, Mushrooms Demystified, where you'll be like deep in a key reading some um, crazy mushroom, you know, description, and then you'll be laughing uh, because he said some ridiculously funny thing. And um, while I'm not, I'm not that funny, I, I really appreciate what you said, because I tried to put a lot of um, my own, my own love for this funny little organism in there. Well, it comes through. <laughs> Thank you. So I had a question, what happens when slime molds get damaged, first of all? And second of all, if you were to like rip some of that plasmodium off of that redwood shoot, could you reproduce it asexually by moving it? Do they ever reproduce asexually in the wild by damage to the plasmodium? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think um, similarly to lichen, how um, one of their major um, methods of reproduction is just like fractioning off, that would totally work while it's in its plasmodial stage. And it would also work when it's a bit more mature um, because then you would have even more options for spore dispersal. Um, so while, some of it might might be damaged by crushing or something. It would it would continue to to do its thing if you like broke that redwood branch or redwood um, in half and threw some over here. Um, it would most likely continue doing it, doing its thing. Molding on, all right. <laughs> exactly. Keep on molding keep, on. Keep calm and mold on. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Exactly. Cool, thank you. Carrie, mm -hmm. I wanna thank you for your time tonight. I feel like uh, I'm able to look at slime molds in a new light and kind of hopefully I'll feel comfortable talking to visitors because we do get a lot of questions about them. And so this, this was very, very helpful um, and we all appreciate your time so, so, so much. So thank you for being here. Can we all kind of like, if we have additional questions, can we reach out to, to you or how, how should is there a certain like avenue that you want us to sort of uh follow if we have additional questions yeah you can feel free to email me i am um somewhat responsive on my email i try to get back to people but uh um with 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 a work email and then and then personal email but email is definitely the best way i would love pictures and questions um and i will try to get back to you in a timely manner um i can write my email in the chat can I? Oh, I see there's, um, and then also if anyone is interested, the, my email's also in the um, front cover of the book, if anyone um, has that and would like to reference it. But my email's in the chat. I'm happy to send out this PowerPoint um, if anyone wants it. Um, yeah, happy to answer further slime mold questions as they come up the best I can. 